Layla, you like these cookies. You better watch it though. You're gonna lose your girlish figure. Layla, and this is Bo, and this is their roadmap to success. Now, as I mentioned in the other, one of the other videos, Layla was found, uh, and she's only been in the house about a week. And so <clears throat> she's still kind of figuring out her place, and I think she's pushing the boundaries, trying to uh, assert herself, you know, because it's, it's all new. And he's a little bit of a nervous dog, so I think that he is, uh, this is a little unnerving for him, and I think that the combination has kind of been a little bit of a self-esteem crash for him. So uh, one of the things I'd like the Guardians to do, especially for him, but really be, makes sense to do it for both dogs at the same time, is to have, uh, there's two Guardians, and have each one of them practice teaching the dog a new trick or command each week. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, when we do this, separate the dogs, work with them one at a time. There you go, that's a good crash, Layla. <coughs> Drank too much water. Um, so uh, dogs, just like us, the more skills they have, the better and the more confident they feel. So if we can build Bo up, by giving him some different tricks and commands, that's going to help his confidence. <coughs> now right here, I'm trying to give him a treat. Barely interested. So if he won't take a treat, that means he's kind of in a heightened sense of being flustered or whatever the case may be. So um, if, he's taking, if he won't take a treat, look at the situation. Try to move her away, lower the intensity somehow, increase the distance, lower the speed, something along those lines. If you're on a, whoops, Layla, come here. Here, sweetheart. There's one right up here for you. Yes, I want you in the shot. Yes, good girl. She's a good little dog, but she's, again, she's a little bit pushy. There we go. And, uh, all right, so um, the uh, if we trade off teaching, so teach both dogs a new trick and all week long practice that trick until they really have it down, then the next guardian takes over. <coughs> and so we're gonna go back and forth. Oh, yes, sweetheart. Until at the end of uh, two months, they both have eight new tricks. That's gonna be a real nice self-esteem boost for him. Now, anything your dog is doing when, you're, when you pet it and you're re, is what you're reinforcing. And I think the guardians for years have been petting and unintentionally reinforcing nervousness and insecurities in both. So we can let our dog know I'm here with you by touching without amplifying. But if I start petting a dog that's nervous, I'm gonna make it more nervous. If I pet a dog that's half excited, I'm gonna make it more excited. So when we come home, we should ignore the dogs completely, wait for them to settle down. When they're nice and settled down, then we can go to pet them. And if we reach towards them, they get excited, we withdraw. This is kind of what I talked about in the video about the uh, leashing process. So we're just gonna abort things when the dogs get too excited until they learn just the only way I'm gonna get my way is be calm and in balance. And in balance, they're gonna be le uh, create less of a problem. This is that uh, counter conditioning technique I mentioned in the other video where we're letting her chew on the treats and little, little nibbles. Um, all right, now I went over a focus exercise with the Guardians. They both practice it with both dogs separately. And when you're doing this, I would practice maybe with one of the dogs in there, preferably her in there and him out here, because that's where his sanctuary is. And I want him to practice doing more stuff out here to build his confidence. And so um, the focus exercise, remember, at first it's one second, then one second. And uh, in real world, it'd be like this. Don't hold it up here and wait and don't go dilly down around. And one of the guardians, when we were out practicing, started adding time. We don't want to do that right away. We want to really establish it at first. So one second, one second, and say the treat. And every time we give a treat, we're going to say the word after the treat goes in the dog's mouth. After the dog's pretty much staring at us, the next step is one step or one second, two seconds on the second movement for all 12 treats. And I'd like both guardians to do it with each dog twice a day. So each dog's getting four practices a day. Um, and eventually we want to get to the point where it's one second, 20 seconds before we deliver that treat. So we can hold the dog's focus. Um, now don't lure it and try not to make the kissing sounds or anything like that. We just want to wait for the dog to look up at us naturally. Don't move your hands away. That was you, not me. Don't move your hands away. Don't lure them. Let her figure it out on her own and let him figure it out on his own. But then if you see that she's starting to give warning signs that she's, that, uh, or he's giving warning signs that they're uncomfortable, then we can actually set, give them a focus command and redirect them away from each other to look up at us. Now the warning signs I promised to go over, uh, usually the first thing that she's going to do probably that's going to trick a response from him is to stare at him, often with a lowered head. So if you see her staring at him and he gets up and moves away, she's kind of saying, hey, I'm not happy with what you're doing. So we don't want to allow her to do that. We want to give her a redirect. Now I, sometimes you could use a, a hissing sound, one of my, the first escalating consequence, but it really bothers him. So I would really try to give him a focus exercise or do something to get her to look at us. Um, Stopping an argument before it actually gets started is much, much easier than once it's already established. Um, other signs, uh, warning signs could be uh, turning the head away. 
Um, she often will interse intersect herself between uh, Bo and the humans. That's a way of blocking his access to them. So we have to disagree. We would make, use the third consequence and make her move away when that happens. Now make sure we do this, we don't have any friendly fire. So if she's really close to him, we might pick her up or grab her by the collar to gently pull her away, uh, increase some distance before we start doing some of these things so we don't want her to nip at him and that'll make him even more nervous or anxious. Uh, let me see, hackles, this, the hair going up on really between her uh, shoulder blades on her butt. Some plant dogs have it on the tail. That's an involuntary reflex trying to make herself look bigger. Uh, by itself, it's not something I would be worried about, but if I start seeing the hackles go up and the tail go up and the dog's licking its lips and it's staring and it freezes or it starts breathing fast or starts breathing slow, those can be warning signs as well. Uh, so if you see, and he's giving what we call sleepy eyes, which is looks like you know very slow eyes, that's kind of a... Uh, a welcoming, you know, a, a sign that I'm a little bit uh, real, uh, trying to be less confrontational, maybe is the way to put it. Um, so the more that we can recognize the dog's signs and then increase distance between them or redirect them into a focus exercise, something else, we can stop a lot of fights from happening before. Now he's going to be your best indicator. He's licking his lips a little bit. He's, he's kind of lightly biting. His eyes are also a little bit pupil. His pupils are a little bit dilated. Now she's been actually keeping him off the couch. And so one of the rules I usually suggest is not being allowed on the furniture, but in his case, I would probably, because he's a little bit insecure in status, I would let him be on the furniture and not allow her on the furniture. Make sure we, he has to get an invitation to get up, but be careful that uh, you know, if we're correcting him, that she's not nearby. I want, don't want her to think it's her job to help correct as well. Uh, let me see, what else? We went through petting with a purpose and passive training. Petting with a purpose is the dog nudges me or scratches at me or barks at me. Instead of petting the dog, I'm gonna give the dog a counter order, tell it to sit. When it sits, I'm going to put under the chin to facilitate that nose up orientation, and I'm just going to say the word sit and nothing else. If it's already sitting, I can ask it to come and sit over here or lie down. It just has to do something to change its state of mind. Hey, Layla. Um, the other thing the dog could do is it can prepay. So the dog just comes up, sits in front of you. It's saying, hey, I'm showing you a new desirable behavior. Make sure you pet and uh, pet the dog and say the word sit or whatever it's whatever she's doing. Just say the word sit. Don't say good sit or Layla sit or what a smart dog. We want to say just the word, command word to make it easy for her and put her in a position to succeed. Now that leads me to passive training, which is just simply recognizing the dog anytime the dog does something that we want it to do. So the dog comes to you on its own accord, pet it and say come. If it sits down next to you, pet it and say sit. Again, preferably under the chin. Never pat on top of the head, you can do anything else. Uh, pet, scratch it anywhere else. And so, uh, oh no, I can't pause, but just go ahead and pass on by. Uh, she has an important phone call, she works for a big company and she's an important person. Uh, let me see. So uh, passive training, if we recognize that the dog came in, the uh, dog did something and we missed it, we might say, no, you're going to stay here. Uh, then we might say paycheck, or excuse me, say reward. And so if somebody says reward to me, I look at the dog and whatever the dog happens to be doing at the time, I pet it. If she's sitting, I pet her and say sit, again, under the chin. If she's standing there, I assume she just came to me, I would pet her and say come. If she's laying down, I would pet her and say crash. Again, try to use fun command words for these new tricks and commands you're going to come up with. Um, and so it's just, now we're teaching the dog that if you do these desired actions, these are a great way to get the human's attention. And the dogs will start to emulate them and offer them more and more frequently because that's what gets attention. A lot of us only give our dogs attention, or a lot of times we give attention when the dog's doing the wrong thing, and we train the dogs to be defiant to get our attention because now we're getting up and we're correcting them. Um, now we went over rules uh, for the dogs to incorporate so that the dogs can start seeing the humans acting like leaders by enforcing rules and boundaries consistently. One of the rules, the furniture uh, rule, for her, she's not gonna be allowed in the furniture after today. And uh, the only way that she's allowed up is with an invitation from a human, not with her own prerogative. Now, uh, I would say at least 30 days or as long as these problems are going on before she's allowed up. When she is, it should be with an invitation and only for good behavior. So if she gets up here and she growls at Bo, she has to get down. Now be careful, don't push her down towards Bo, that can trigger a response. Uh, or she starts barking at, at the door, or at uh, what she sees at, at Santa Monica through your beautiful view, then again, same sort of thing, she has to get off the couch. Or if we invited her up and she got down to get a drink of water, when she comes back, she would need to uh, get another invitation to get back up on the couch. This way, we're controlling the resource and the dog is looking up to, at us for permission. I would recommend getting um, some sort of a blocker that blocks her view out of the kennel so all day long she doesn't bark at people out walking up and down whatever street, I'm not gonna say what street we are on, but so she's not blocking, uh, barking and practicing unwanted behaviors. Um, let me see. Um, focus exercise, I recovered the focus exercise, right? Um, okay, feeding. Make sure that we're feeding them in a structured order. 
I don't think you did in the video. Sorry. In the video, I didn't go I on the structured exercise. The, the focus exercise. Uh, uh, no, I didn't go. Uh, uh, okay, I didn't mention. Well, if that's if you well, want to go. Well, I went through the structure. Uh, how to do it, right? Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you forget how to do the focus exercise, let me know. I can send you okay. videos of going through with yeah. other people. Yeah. But you guys yeah. both got it really gotcha. easily. But make sure you really do that twice a day with each dog and try to get up to the twenty second window within about a week, ten days at the max. Um, for eating, dogs eat in the order of their rank. So I'd like to have Bo eating first uh, while she is outside of the area. And we're going to give him permission to eat. When he's eating, she's not within seven feet of him. And then when, she, when he gets done, she, he leaves the area, and then she gets to eat, and he's not within seven feet of her. But this only happens after whoever's feeding them eats something first. All it has to be five bites. It just doesn't have to be a real meal. But just grab a chip or a cracker or something like that and eat that yourself. That way the humans, they see the humans having more authority, and then the dogs eat after the humans. That helps them adopt more of a follower's mindset. Now, are they pretty good eaters or fast eaters? Or She is. Bo only eats at night. Okay, uh, so dogs should eat a couple times a day. This is, I just went through this my morning session. So what I do is I put food in the morning in the breakfast, uh, in the bowl, and then it's time to feed. And if the dog goes up and sniffs and walks away, I pick up the bowl, I dump the food out of it, and I put the empty bowl back down. Uh, the, that way I want the dog to walk by the bowl all day long seeing that it's empty. Now in her case, she'll be in the kennel, but even when she's free, every time she gets a drink of water or whatever else. <laughs> bowl. He's like, I'm not coming over there, but I'm, he's barking at the delivery uh, pickup guy. Yeah. Um, it's okay, sweetheart. Um, so again, I think a lot of the time these dogs are barking. They think they're doing a solid for their humans because the humans didn't have any rules and structure. Um, so the, we're going to eat in a structured manner. And when they eat, take, uh, give them each a unique command word. So when she's eating, maybe we say ch chow. So when she takes her first bite for the first two months, we say chow. Just for the first bite after she takes it. When she hears chow, there's food in her mouth. When Bo hears chow, there's no food in his mouth. So it means something to her, it doesn't mean something to him. When Bo eats, maybe we say feast. And then when Bo eats, he hears that word. So then you can actually give the dog a command word to eat without having to worry about you know one dog being confused about it. One of the things you should teach them how to do is to stay. Um, find a good video and message me and I can send you a great a video at a great length, the technique that I use for the stay. Um, when you do the stay, um, they should each have a separate unique command word. So I can say freedom for her and release for him. And that way I can put them both in a stay and release just one dog when necessary. That makes it very helpful to managing your dog's behavior. Um, let me see what else. Um, went through the leashing process. Um, again, take your time and practice the leashing process at times when you're not planning on taking the dogs for a walk. So they get practice, oh, another drill, we're not going for a walk. We want to take that excitement out of them because like I said, the excited energy can lead, very easily lead them into the wrong thing. Um, am I missing something? I'm probably missing a lot. I cover a lot in three hours. So is the idea of the focus exercise to, well, one of the ideas, if we see a, a trigger on the street, like a, a child or, yeah. or something like that, to say focus. Exactly. And then divert their attention. Exactly. Okay. Now something else I do is I create a U-turn command for my dogs. As I'm, and again, when you're walking the dogs initially, walk them one at a time. I would like, actually it's a good point, I would like them walk together at least once a day. And so if you guys both have to take one of them and have the couple in the middle and the dogs on the outside, that's fine, but keep them all next to you with short leashes. And even just to walk around the block, I want him to have experiences with her where they're moving forward. That's very important for dog rehabilitation. Um, uh, what was I talking about before that? Um, focus exercise. Um, oh, the U-turns. So when you're walking with one dog, let's say give each dog a side. So Layla is always on the right or always on the left. So no matter who's walking her, dog walker or you, she goes, this is where I go, this is my spot. And he goes, this is my spot. So that way they both have a position. And that way you can correct them on the leash independently if you need to. If, if you use the splitter, which you use now, and I try to pull it and I need to correct her, I'm correcting Bo too. And that will uh, lower his self-esteem. So what I do is as I'm walking, let's say she's on this side. If I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna do a U-turn. I'm basically gonna do two ovals. So if I'm walking this way and she's on my side, I'm gonna kind of crouch down and hold the treat out in front, in front of me and let her see it. And as she sees it, she's gonna start walking towards it. Then I'm gonna start turning and I'm gonna release the treat when she's facing, going, when we turned a U-turn or going the other direction and I'm gonna say the word uh, turn. Then I'm gonna walk four steps that way and I'm gonna repeat the process. So we're basically gonna do a little oval. Four steps, four steps, and then go. Only do this when there's nobody around. This way, if you're going down the street and you see a little kid come out of an apartment or run out of a car or something like that, and you see it before Bo sees it, 
You do a turn, he just turns around expecting to get that treat, and now you've taken away the, the trigger before he gets a chance to even respond to it. But increasing the distance between your dog and triggers is very important. Something else we talked about off camera was uh, not forcing the dog in uh, uh, situations it considers dangerous. So if the dog sees something and shuts down, it doesn't want to walk towards it, and you keep on forcing the dog to go towards it, you're breaking your trust with the dog and making the dog more panicky, and that's going to exasperate all your problems. So if there's somebody walking up and your dog st slows down and stops, look for a driveway or a little uh, you know, uh, sidewalk to go up to somebody's house or apartment. Go around a car and block the dog's vision from it or increase the distance. Don't force your dog to do something it doesn't want to do because that creates a lot of anxiety. It dumps cortisol into their bloodstream and then it can activate their adrenal glands and now they have a chemical process as well as a psychological problem. If we get in a car accident, I can't just immediately say calm down. I have to take a couple of minutes for my blood, for my, I think my liver, to filter that stuff out of my bloodstream. It, same thing for your dog. If your dog sees it, what it perceives as danger, we get closer and closer. I'm getting more and more apprehensive. It's going to be harder and harder for them to be non-reactive. If you can redirect them with a focus exercise or do a U-turn or move them out of line of sight when it's just barely seeing and it's barely, barely registering, much easier for the dog to recover faster. The more it recovers the, and the faster it recovers, the faster it will recover in the future. Now it's practicing a different, more positive behavior. Now, if we have problems with the uh, skateboard, the conditional emotional response that I did in that video, let me know there's a different technique that we can use. I think this one will work well, but we'll see. Um, but I think the main thing is the guardians were, like I said, petting the dog, when he, Bo, when he was nervous, and I think that, that has kind of exasperated a lot of things unintentionally over the course of the last six and a half, seven years. Um, what do you say? Yes, she said, I love how cute her little furry uh, tootsies are. Look at that. Uh, but she's a great little dog. I think she's, like I said, just trying to assert herself by adding a little bit of structure. Also remember the tether. So maybe a tether over her over there with the leash. So if she's being nuisance or something like that, with, or uh, Bo keeps on flailing the room, if you have a leash, a four foot leash tethered around the, the, the entertainment unit there, she can go in her kennel if she wants and she can uh, hang out and Bo can feel comfortable knowing that she can't get to her. Now, the other thing is we don't want to pick her up and put her in the kennel. Remember to order a, bed, a kennel bed liner, measure their kennel, and you'll be able to get one that'll fit exactly. Just go to Amazon, they're pretty cheap. Um, and take the rest of those blankets and stuff out. Make sure it's a light cream color. That way, when you want to practice having her go in there, remember to use the long side of the kennel, not the side uh, entrance. Open it, toss a treat in there. Let her go in and get it and say beach or palace or whatever the word for the kennel is. Again, come up with a fun one. And then let her get it and leave. And then toss another one in there, get it and leave. So eventually it gets to the point where you just say beach and she runs over and runs into the beach and then you give her the treat after she does the skill. But if you pick her up or force her in there or snatch her in there, eventually she's not going to want to go in there or she's going to start barking and protesting when she's in there. That's going to be a whole different set of problems. If she's not already barking, she probably is going to start barking at people outside because we're in an uh, elevated position. She thinks anybody on the street is violating her, uh, her authority. So if we just put a blocker or something, don't put it in the kennel because you'll probably rip it down, but if you put something maybe on the, uh, maybe some structure paper or something like that on the, the window there, that way just she can't see out there, out of sight, out of mind. Um, if they continue barking at people in the hallway, let me know, I can send you, show you how to use uh, um, counter conditioning to stop them from doing that. We would just need somebody to trigger the sound on the other side of the door. All right, Layla, did you have fun? It's like, I want to get down, you're too hot. It's, it's warm, it's Santa Monica in February. What well, could be better? All right, this is Layla, and uh, Bo was in the other room, and this is their roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you meet it.